standing up here, I'm sure, I mean, they can take it. When you look over there, she's always smiling and singing with us. And that makes life easier, doesn't it? So, Lord, we thank you for this morning. We thank you again for this wonderful day that you have made. And we want to lift up Miss Stacy and say thank you for uh, her being here this morning. And I just keep touching her and blessing her. And for everyone here, as Coach Miss Tessa, touch their lives and just uh, bless them. I pray for a great morning this morning here at church. And we just thank you for everything that you're going to do. In Jesus' name, the church said, Amen. Amen. Let's all stand and sing.
good this morning. All right, y'all, turn around, shake hands with your neighbor. Say good morning to see you. Good to see you this morning, neighbor. What that's about is we had an estimate on the roof overall at one point. It was going to cost like some $41,000 to do it. We had another guy uh, actually just show up to buy barbecue chicken. Uh, what, last week, I guess? Was that the end? Boy, they all just blend together after a while. But uh, he showed up and was doing his thing. And one thing led to another, and of course, conversation from the fact that I worked for a roofing place. And he said, Well, you mind if I go and take a look at what your problem is? I got going to uh, go up the ad with him. That's because of that chicken <laughs> <laughs> stuff all over there. He said, there's a fat chicken. Yeah, he was up to his armpits and chicken, so I had to go up the ad. He originally, he originally asked what all this was be, what, 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 what all this money was being raised for. Yeah. And, we, and I think one of the ladies downstairs says it was going to be to put a roof on the church. And uh, so, and that's why he was, they kind of pointed in my direction. And guess what I did? I pointed to the pastor's direction. So I, lost I, the book. I lost 28 pounds that afternoon. But anyway, uh, <laughs> took him up the attic and uh, we, we found all the bad spots and stuff like that. And he actually ended up going back on top of the roof by himself and, and checking it even closer. And he discovered after looking at it really well that the only area that actually really needed attention was this arch over here on this side. And he said, you know, really, he said, surprisingly, the rest of your roof is really not in that bad of shape. He said, and quite frankly, he said, if you'd had a heat vent in this side or in this building to start with, he said, we wouldn't even be having this conversation today. So here's what we're looking at. We're looking at the, that company coming and actually replacing all the wood on that side, all the shingles on that side, and also they'll put a heat vent uh, in that side as well. And they're going to do all of that for uh, $10,000. Very, very good deal. Uh, we're already, if you take a look at the thermometer, we're already about 22, 23. I won't tell you another promise that has been made because I'm not ready to let you know yet, but it's taken us up a little bit further. And there's even perhaps some others that are already thinking in the direction of where to give. But anyway, what we're going to do is we're going to wait till that thermometer is full. When that thermometer is full, then we'll do the roof. Amen? We ain't going to go into credit and all that mess. We ain't going to America Express to get a roof fixed. Hello? Yeah. Bless God, we'll raise the dang our money and we'll fix the roof. Amen? We'll be done with it. All right? We don't have to worry about it after that. When we walk away that afternoon and the roof is fixed, we don't know nobody nothing. Amen? Amen. Amen. Y'all understand that? Does that make sense? Amen. That's the, way all of us, that's the way all of us ought to be living. Amen? All of us, period. Notice I said all of us ought to be living that way, right? So anyway, that's what that's all about. And uh, if you want to do that, uh, we'll play that now. Okay, all right. So recently, uh, someone decided to bless the church with what we call a day sponsor on our radio station, WBFJ, that we be okay, but I work for as well. But um, you don't understand the, the fullness of what is behind the day sponsor. A day sponsor, for the way this person paid for it, was almost $1,000 worth of advertising. And so this past Thursday, we had a two minute and five second spot that played somewhere between 12 and 15 times. Uh, Thursday and Thursday, by the way, I did my homework because you know since I work there, I can ask questions other people don't think about. I asked uh, them. I said, "Tell me what the best numbers of the day each week are." And they said, "Well, Thursdays is definitely the best. That's fine. I'll take Thursday." And so that's why we played it this past Thursday. Had lots of really good feedback. I even had a couple of emails while I was live on the air from people saying, "Wow, I really enjoyed your spot about your grandson and your church." Now here's why they said grandson and church. If you got it ready, Travis, we're going to go play it for you right now. Hi, I'm Tracy Webb, pastor of New Vision Baptist Worship Center in Clemens, North Carolina, and we're happy to bring you this day sponsor on WBFJ. Proverbs 17, 6 says, Children's children are the crown of old men, and the glory of children are their fathers. A little over five years ago, a few weeks before my grandson was born, my brother-in-law and I were discussing how my grandson's birth would make me feel. I looked at my brother-in-law and said, I already had a good idea because... Uh, you know how I feel about my nephew. He looked at me and said, No, trust me. You just wait. Then came the day of my grandson's birth. I was pulled out of the revival meeting we were having at the time. I was shown his brand new picture from the newborn's camera shot. And I started to cry so hard that the pew on which I was sitting started to shake. Heading to the hospital to meet my grandson face to face for the first time, I called my brother-in-law to apologize. I said to him, you were right, you know, when my sons were born, I felt as if I could conquer the world. But now that I've seen this little fellow's face, 
I know beyond all shadow of doubt, I can conquer the universe. Proverbs 17, 6 is exactly right. My grandson is like a crown for and to me. Makes me stop to think about something else. If I feel this way about my grandson, how does God really feel about me, about you? I've got a sneaky suspicion it involves a crown. And remember, I am a grandfather, but he is the grandest of fathers. If this short message blessed you and you're looking for a place of worship, please consider joining us at New Vision Baptist Worship Center, 4765 Hampton Road in Clements, North Carolina. We have Sunday school at 945. Our morning worship service is at 11. And we have Bible study and prayer on Wednesday evenings at 7. We're thankful for your attention today. And we're also thankful for the opportunity to bring you this day sponsor on WBFJ. So there you go. Two minutes and five seconds, some 15 times before that day. And we have tons of feedback from it. Lots of folks asking not only about the church, but about other things, you know, as far as, you know, how do you get this? Or really the station got blessed, the church got blessed. Who knows what could come out of that? I'd love to be able to sometime in the future have a little one-minute type thing very similar to that someday, you know, where they could actually get a little taste, you know, of what we teach and preach and what have you. I think sometimes if people just knew that it's okay, you know, you don't have to be afraid. It's all right. Don't be scared. It's okay. Go in there. I'm not going to bite you. I'm not going to do anything. You won't get infected, except maybe with good things now. Amen? Amen. Uh, they might actually come through the doors. Amen? They might also actually come through the doors if you grab them by their wrist, throw a pair of handcuffs on them, and just drag them right in. But anyway, we won't get into that. But uh, anyhow, that's what that was all about. So let's just stand up if you would, please. And we'll go ahead and pray over all of them before we take it. Father, we just thank you today, first of all, for the things that you are doing. And Lord, you know, your word makes it very clear that if we would just come together in unity and not fight and argue and, and goof around with each other about, well, this is better than that, this is better than that, just help us to shut up and listen to you, Father. And help us to pay attention to what your precious Holy Spirit is telling us to do, how to live, how to be, how to love. Now, Father, we thank you that as we take this offering, we do so in the process of planting seed. Because, Father, this is not just another part of the service where we toss our money in the bucket. But, Father, this is good people who are honoring you and planting their hard work for seed into ground that they believe is good ground. And, Father, I pray that you would bless their seed, that it might bring forth a harvest above and beyond what they might think. Thank you for blessing them. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. Let men give back into their bosoms for their obedience and honoring you. We thank you for this today. In Jesus' name, everybody said, Amen. 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 Let's just wait. Silent offerings are better than noisy offerings. You know why, don't you? Because they're putting in. Never mind, I'm not going to get into it. I think they are. I was just trying to fill time while they were walking back there. <laughs> that's, uh, that's an outstanding sing Our last song, this song is called More Precious Than Silver. You know, no matter what you no matter how far it is. Far you look or how hard you look, there's nothing that you can find on this earth that can replace what you know, can do and what God means to us. Amen. So let's sing about it. You're singing to him this morning. Sing it.
most precious jewels and everything that's here on earth. Nothing compares to you because you made it all. Nothing here on earth compares to the love that you give us. Thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You can be seated. So we started last week on a series, Signs of the Times, How to Know, Stop, from Go. No slides again today. If you don't have a Bible, scooch over beside somebody who does. We uh, looked at Matthew 24, 3 through 14 last week. We also looked at 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 18 last week. And I told you this morning we would start here at 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 1 through 17. How many of you have heard about the 6.0 magnitude quake that hit Northern California this morning? You know, immediately, I promise you right now, I promise you, just as there were people in pulpits starting to preach, hellfire damnation and end of the world, as soon as everything started happening in Israel again, this morning there are no doubt preachers who are preaching the same hellfire damnation over a 6.0 earthquake in California. See, I'm going to tell you what people do. People get so freaked out so fast, and they start running their mouths about what they think is going to take place. You know what the problem is there? Quit thinking. Start reading. Start paying attention to what the Bible actually says. Listen to what the Holy Spirit is saying to your heart. Quit listening to the pundits on television and everybody and their stinking brother that thinks they've got it all figured out. Amen? Because I got news for you. Last time I checked, CBS, NBC, ABC... MSNBC, CNN, and even Fox. Makes no difference who they are. If it's a news agency, and while I will admit Fox does a little bit better job than most of it, it seems, while I still will admit them this, they are men, they are women, they are people. And they're paid to do a job. You know what their number one job is? To keep the numbers up, keep the ratings up where they belong, so that their commercial advertisers will continue to spend money with them. And so they will say things and bring up things and bring up items and bring up issues to get your attention very quickly. So I will grant you right now that there are some people this morning that are scared to death that the rapture is going to take place this week because there was a 6.0 earthquake in Northern California. You know when I would get concerned? I would get concerned whenever the St. Andrews Fall finally splits wide open and California falls into the ocean. Then I might get a little concerned. Hello? But it hasn't happened. He said, well, why don't you start off with all that? Because this is the kind of mentality that is usually placed behind these kinds of teachings. They're taught to put fear and doom and gloom into the hearts of the people that hear about it. And i got news for you. Even though we're not right now in the book of Revelation, we will be, I promise you, before this series is over. The book of Revelation is not about doom and gloom. The book of Revelation, as a matter of fact, let's go ahead and look at the first chapter of Revelation real quick. I'll read something to you here and let you see it with your own eyeballs, all right? Revelation chapter 1, very first part of it, I want you to see it. Revelation chapter 1, verse 1. The revelation of who? Of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto who? Unto him, unto Jesus Christ, to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass, and he sent and signified it by his angel and to his servant John. So it wasn't given to John first. It was given to Jesus first. And as a matter of fact, if I remember right, there's a, another verse where he literally says, if you'll just read what's in here, pay attention to it, and do as you're told, you will be blessed. And blessed in the Greek means happy, well off, good to go. Not, if you read what's in this book of Revelation, you will be full of doom and gloom and scared to death and don't want to go into your dark house at night anymore. Hello. Heard a guy say this literally yesterday. He said that when he first started hearing Revelation and end times being taught, that when he first went back home that night, he said to himself before he got out of his car, you know, I might have should have left the light on. Because it was fear had built up in him listening to those teachings. I don't want to build fear into you with what we're talking about. What I want to build into you is a knowledge of what God's Word actually says. Amen? Amen. Let's quit thinking about what God's Word says. Let's quit trying to think we understand better than anybody else, so therefore we shall say blah, blah. And let's look at what the Bible actually really does say. Amen? And in order to do that, you've got to realize, you've got to be willing to dig. Amen? 
And that's what I've done with this. As a matter of fact, <laughs> trust me, it's going to be a while. This is going to last a while, okay? But I promise you, I'm not going to drag it on each Sunday. We'll just pick up where we left off from Sunday to Sunday, amen? So 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, let's look at verses 1 through 17. Now what's happening here is Paul is beginning to go a little deeper into what is referred to oftentimes as the time of evil. Now see, immediately you think, well see, there you go, if it's a time of evil, shouldn't I be getting scared? No, just listen, all right? 2 Thessalonians 2, verses 1 through 17. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him, that ye be not soon shaken in mind, or be troubled, neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter from us, as that day, as that the day of Christ is at hand. Now immediately I'm going to back up here. I'm going to break down verse 2 for you. That you be not soon shaken. It means that you be not disturbed or made to waver. Don't become double-minded in your stance because you're trying to think. See, this is where people immediately start thinking, well, if God's that mean and will allow those kinds of things to happen, then I don't want anything to do with it. Well, you know what? God's not, quote-unquote, that mean. But God is that righteous. And sin has to be dealt with. Now, if you don't believe it, parents, then tell me how long you will sit there when your little child walks up in front of you and stands there in front of your knees and starts spitting in your face. How long do you think you'll sit there and take it? Huh? Now, I know some parents, they're goofy enough to say, oh, well, it's just cute. I mean, it's only spit. What's it going to hurt? Really? You moron. Wake up. Hello? I mean... You know why a lot of kids have turned into the things they've turned into today? Because of this goofy society that we now live in that has decided that kids should never be touched physically in correction. Now, I'll agree with one thing. You should never use your hands to, quote, unquote, whip your child. You know why? Because your hands were made for blessing. But read your Bible. Spare the rod, spoil the child. You know what? How many of you in here are over 50? Raise your hand. Stand up if you're over 50. Just make a stand with me. I'm over 50, so we're all standing together, right? Uh, all right. So we're going to make this declaration together. How many of us over 50 ever had a switch applied to our legs? How about a paddle? How about a belt even from time to time? Oh, and you're how old? And you're not in prison. Oh, how many of y'all on drugs this morning and can't wait to get out of here to go have your crack? <laughs> Sit down. Thank you. I'm going to tell you something right now. The reason we've got the state in society that we've got today is because we've got a bunch of lazy, goofy, non-spoken parents. Amen. Who, because they were corrected a certain way, think, well, I did do that. It is what it is. Then we come over here and we see that God says, look, if you do this, I have no choice. This must take place. And people, and I might even mention one of them by name because if I did, you know exactly who it was. Trust me. Believe me. They made the comment one day, well, if God's that way, then I don't want anything to do with him. And so they started doing everything the opposite. Before, this same person would get on television and say, well, yes, praise the Lord. I agree with that. Amen. Oh, good to see you. Yes, I'm a Christian. Now, they have nothing to do with it. And even have been involved in seances live on television. Because they think that's the new spirituality. Now, bear in mind. What I was raised in and the abuse that I received physically, that's not what I'm referring to when I talk about correction, believe me. I had a set of parents that did it wrong, and then I had a set of grandparents that did it right. And thank God for the grandparents, amen? Amen. Because they were able to heal what the parents didn't do right. Amen? Now, I realize when you get into something like this, you've got as many opinions as there are bald heads in this room right now, okay? <laughs> And I can count a few bald heads in here this morning, 
Okay? Everybody's got their opinion. You've heard how that happens. Most of them stink. Anyway, we won't get into that. But uh, it's time to start receiving God's Word for what it says, doing what it says, living what it says, which means I've got to believe what it says, which quite frankly, I heard numbers yesterday that 90 now percent of Christians, when they are asked to honestly answer the question, do you read your Bible, 90 percent of Christians say, only when I'm at church. 90 percent. So 10% of Christians today are reading their Bible somewhere else than in church. No wonder when people come to church sometimes, they sit there either scratching their heads or getting red in the face because they're mad at the preacher for telling them the truth. God loves us. Do you believe that? Yes. Amen. Jesus said, thy word is truth. Didn't he? You know, he's still saying it right now. Every time you speak God's word, Jesus turns to the Father and he says, Father, your word is truth. And remember what you promised. You promised that if they would know your truth, you would set them free. Amen. Do you know that he does that? Do you know that he literally is just like, as if a lawyer, so to speak, he's our spokesperson. He constantly reminds God of what is rightfully ours. So you don't think about that. Let me tell you what you do think about that. Well, I don't know why I'm getting off on this, but apparently somebody needs it. So I'm just going to keep going. I told you this might take forever to get through the series. So be it. If you're running around all the time concerned about what you think God can give you, then you're serving the wrong God. Amen. Now, if you're listening, say amen really good. Amen. If all you're after from God is what you can get, please, get out now. Because you're serving the wrong God. You should never go to God for what you can get. I can prove it to you. You ready? Jesus said, but you have no need to ask your Father for anything. That's right. But we do it all the time. Lord, oh Lord, oh pray, pray the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Bless the Lord. Hallelujah. Pray the Lord. I'm right here in your presence, Father. And I just saw a commercial for a brand new car, Lord. Oh, no, Lord, I know I've never thought about Get me a BMW there before. But I just, I don't know, I kind of like have the mouth of that sitting in my driveway. <laughs> really? Huh? Or you haven't married her yet, so you take her out to the store, and you walk up to the counter where all the shiny sparklers are, and you realize that you can't afford $118,603.17 for a ring. But you look at it and you think, boy, would that impress her. I'll just go in debt for five lifetimes, and then she'll love me. You know what? You hang out with somebody who loves you for nothing more than that, you better get rid of them right now. Hello? Now, mm -hmm. notice I did not say you was already married. I said you was thinking about getting married. So if you're already married you got that problem, you're going to work it out. Hello? <laughs> All right? Don't go to God for what you can get. But in the same manner, don't, don't try to figure out what you can get from everybody and their brother on a regular basis. Now, I don't know who needed that, and I'm done with that part. Thank you very much. Let's just move on. So... See that you be not soon shaken, be not disturbed, be not made to waver in what? In mind, which means in your thoughts, in your feelings, or in your will. So now wait a minute, remember, he's actually talking about end times, all right? See, so look what he says in verse 1. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus and by our gathering together unto him. That's the rapture. That's the rapture, all right? And so that's end times, so to speak, all right? That's how a lot of people see it. When in reality, the rapture is not end times. End times, quite frankly, is the last day of a millennial reign when God finally says, done with this earth, done with this universe, it's gone, brand new earth, 
brand new universe. We live forever, eternally. Sin is dead. It's gone. It's non-existent. Sickness, pain, fear, nowhere to be found. Amen. Perfection, godliness, holiness, presence of God, with God, about God, for God, all God. Forever and ever and ever and ever. That's end times. Amen. End of that time, beginning of the best time. You know, you remember heard, you heard the old saying in, in the books, I forget the author, but it was the best of times and it was the worst of times. You know what? I think all of us have been through the worst of times. Amen? Probably some of us still have yet more to experience. But all of us sitting here this morning have something to look forward to that I can promise you will be the absolute beyond all shadow of doubt like you've never experienced it before, the best of times. And that's where this is leading us. So see when you think about this gathering together to him, this rapture, see that you not be disturbed or made to waver in your thoughts. See that your feelings aren't affected in such a way that you, be, that you get into fear. See that your will is not affected in such a way that you think, well, maybe I should do this now that I know this. No, listen. See that you be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled. Troubled here means see that you be not frightened to the point of shaking and crying out loud. Do you know that this is why the Bible actually says, and these are Jesus' words, he said that during these times when all this stuff that we think right now is so bad, trust me, it's going to get worse later. And when it does get worse and some of the crazy things really start to take place that we read about in this Bible, when those things start to take place, the Bible says that there will be some people who will literally die of a heart attack because they were actually scared to death. And yet here, he says... See that you be not frightened to the point of shaking and crying out loud. How? Whether it be by spirit. He said neither by spirit. Which means if they say this was from the spirit of God. And I got news for you. There's plenty of good. I guess I'll use that word. Little G good. Okay. Not big G good. There's plenty of good people running around in church services and meetings and whatever right now. Who will walk up to you and they will say, thus saith the Lord. I know, because I've been there. I've even been involved in it. Y'all know my background. Y'all know what I was there for almost 30 years before I came back to my roots. And I've not let go of a lot of those things. Amen? But here's what I know for a fact. If somebody says, thus saith the Lord to you, whatever they say after, thus saith the Lord, had better line up with this book, or else I got news for you, it wasn't the Lord. Now, if you're still listening, say Amen. amen. So when somebody comes to you and says, now I'm going to tell you this by the Spirit of God. You know why they usually preface what they're about to say to you with that? They're trying to impress you and make you think that they're more spiritual than they actually are. When in reality, they're nothing. And I don't care how famous, how rich, how big their name is or not. It makes no difference to me. If they walk up to me and they say, thus saith the Lord, or they look at me and they say, hey, I need to share this with you by the Spirit of God, you know what I'm going to say to them? I'm going to say to them, I'll tell you what, I'll listen to what you got to say, but if I think you're wrong, I'm going to tell you to your face. Hello? Mm -hmm. But see, sadly, a lot of Christians will accept something like that, and they'll say, well, praise God, they said that it was the Lord, so it must be the truth. No, it's not. And there's a lot of non-truths being shared right now about in times. And we need the correct truth. Amen? Alright. So, neither by spirit, if they say it was from the spirit of God, nor by word, which means someone else told them, hearsay, as it may be, nor by letter, as from us, meaning they may say they read it in one of our letters. You ever had anybody walk up to you and do that? Lord have mercy, you know what, I got something from somebody the other day, and here's what they said, so you know it must be true. Really? When are we going to learn that man is not the final word? God's word is forever settled in heaven. Your words are up for negotiation. Do you understand that? Always. Your thoughts are up 
for negotiation. You know how I know that? Because nine times out of ten, and even then some, I think the percentage is like 97% or something, it's been proven, uh, of the things that you think about and worry about, never happen! Now some of our champion warriors might say, yeah, the reason it doesn't happen is because I worry about it. And if I worry about it, that means I'm taking care of it. No, you worrying today takes away the joy that God has for you today about the victory that might not show up until tomorrow. I said something to my grandson recently about, uh, you know, going to sleep that night and, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a new day. And then I woke him up <coughs> and the next morning. And I said, all right, little buddy, it's a new day. Now, I kid you not, fresh out of sleep, eyeballs just popped open. Here's what the kid says to me, five years old, right? Hey, little buddy, it's a new day. He went, no, it ain't. Tomorrow's a new day. <laughs> <laughs> and so I looked at him and I said, well, today is yesterday's tomorrow. So there you go, it's a new day. Come on, get out of bed. <laughs> right? So anyway, no matter how they say it to you, no matter why they say it to you, make sure what they say lines up with God's word. Amen. But look what he's referring to. He says all of these things are about as that the day of Christ is at hand. Verse 3. Let no man deceive you by any means. For that day shall not come except there come a falling away first and that, that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. All right. Now right here, verse 3. The, first of all, look at that phrase, let no man deceive you. It means let no man seduce you wholly. Now, what's that mean, wholly? Not H-O-L-Y, but W-H-O-L-L-Y. What's that mean, wholly? Completely. Through and through. Let no one seduce you wholly. Let, let no one beguile you by any means, for that day shall not come. Now, notice, that day shall not come. In your Bible, King James Version, is that in italics? So that was not in the original text. You understand that? So here's how the original text read. For except there come a falling away. For except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. And that sentence is not through yet, but let's go back to it so we can continue to break it down. So let's go ahead and leave the italics in there for now because we are talking about that day. For that day shall not come, Except there come a falling away. This verse used to be the foundation for a lot of teachers who were trying to teach the rapture. They would often blend falling away with catching away. And they would say that this verse was proof of rapture. This verse is not talking about rapture, not verse 3. Verse 1 is... Verse 1 is because it's talking about our gathering together. What does the Bible say? The dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the air. Right? There shall we ever be with the Lord. That's the gathering. That's the great gathering. It's not the second coming of Jesus. It's the blessed appearance. It's the glorious appearance of Jesus. It is the rapture of the church. So verse 1 is the rapture. Verse 3 is not. What is verse 3? Let no man deceive you by any means. For that day shall not come, except there come a falling away. Listen to what that is. Except there come a defection. Now what is a defection? A defection is conscious abandonment from allegiance or duty. Meaning that there will be people who went through all the motions and appeared that they had become solid, absolute, God-fearing, devil-whooping, Bible-believing children of God. But we forget that the Bible says, He who endures to the end shall be saved. You are born again right now. You are a new creature in Christ Jesus. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. You're a new creature. You will be saved when one of two things takes place. Three actions. Well, two, because it boils down to two. One, rapture hits. And we go up. Amen? Pretty much done. Saved. Don't have to worry about anything after that ever again. Amen? Done. Or, or, you die. In your faith. In other words, you take your last breath, 
and you absolutely stayed faithful to God. That being saved by enduring to the end. You say, well, then there's no hope. Yes, there is. See, we got into this goofy belief that there was no possible way for people to quote-unquote do what we used to refer to as backslide. Now, we touched on this a little bit last week. I'm going to go a little bit deeper with it now. Jesus would have never said, a man who sets his hand to the plow and looks back is not fit for the kingdom of God unless he meant it. You know that? Jesus never said anything he didn't mean. So look what he did. He sets his hand to the plow to do what? To plow the earth. To plow the earth with what? With the word of God. To plant the seed of the word of God. But if that person sets his hand to that plow and looks back at what? He's not looking forward to what God tells him to do. He's looking back at what he came from. Oh, you mean a lot like what happened with the children of Israel when they came out of Egypt. At first they were all ecstatic about it. Oh man, look at that. We are like out of Egypt. Dude, come on, high five. You know what I'm saying? Right? So they got out there in the wilderness and things started to go wrong a little bit and they didn't get their food as fast as they thought they should or they were thirstier for longer times than they thought they should be. And then all of a sudden they start having conversations that sound like this. You know what, Moses? <laughs> we were better off when we were in them mud pits trying to make brick. Even without hay, <laughs> we're better off now. Really? What happened to the greater majority of those people before everything was said and done? Died. God destroyed them. But they were the children of Israel when they came out of Egypt, I thought. They were Jews by birth. They had been born. But they did not die in their faith. They died in doubt and unbelief. Doubt and unbelief do not exist in God's presence. Getting awful quiet in this Lutheran church. Oh, we're not Lutheran, sorry. Getting awful quiet in this Presbyterian. Oh, sorry, we're not Presbyterian either. Are we? You're getting awful quiet back there. I hope you're thinking. Because when you start talking about the times that we're looking at right here, you have to remember that there will be situations that are going to come in the future that are going to literally try your faith. Now, you've heard this question posed. We'll say it again this morning. What would you do? How would you react if someone threatened your life except that you denied Jesus Christ verbally? What would you do? Don't answer that question. Just think about it. What would you do? And then remember that right now, there are God-fearing Christians in the Middle East that are dying every day for that very reason. Did you know that? They're being looked at right before that sword is swung at their neck. And they're being given one final opportunity to deny their Christian faith. And when they don't, their head rolls on the ground. But their soul, their spirit, is immediately with Jesus Christ. Amen. What would you do? Let no man deceive you. By any means... That day shall not come unless there be first a great falling away. First, that man of sin will be revealed, meaning he will be disclosed. It means to have the cover taken off. The son of perdition, which by the way, in the Greek it says this. It says, he is the child of physical, spiritual, and or eternal damnation. Listen to that again. The son of perdition is the child of physical, spiritual, and or eternal damnation. That's who the son of perdition is. What does he do? Verse 4. Who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he is God, sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Do you understand that? 
Now, let me tell you where this cat gets his idea. Isaiah, hold your, hold your finger there at 2 Thessalonians 2, and if you have the ability to get quickly over to Isaiah 14, then do so. If not, just listen. Isaiah 14, verses uh, 13 through 14, listen to what it says. For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. Verse 14. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. Who said those words? Lucifer. Lucifer said those words. Who's Lucifer? That's who he became. Do you know that when he made this declaration, he was still Lucifer with a capital L? He was still one of the guarded cherubs of God's throne. Do you know that's what his job was? Do you know that within Lucifer, the Bible says that there were tabrets and pipes built literally within his body so that when he would fly, he was, remember now he's a flying angel. Not all angels are flying angels. So again, read your Bible. It's amazing what you can find out if you just read your Bible. So he was one of the flying angels. And the Bible literally says that as he would fly about the throne of God, protecting it constantly, that the movement of air as he would pass by would, would, would flow through those pipes and those tabrets and beautiful heavenly music would come out of him. And you wonder why today some of the head-banging, hard, heavy metal music goes the directions that it often goes. Because the same cat that was literally created by God with wonderful heavenly musical ability woke up one day and decided, you know what? I didn't wake up. Because remember, he was an eternal being even then. But let's say on our account, he woke up one day and he says, well, I'll tell you what I'm going to do today. I'm going on up to heaven, boys. He's talking to his people, by the way. All right? He's got a congregation he's speaking to. Again, just read your Bible. Amazing what you might learn. So he says, I'm going up into heaven today. Matter of fact, tell you what I'm going to do. This throne here that I'm sitting in, apparently he had one. Because he said, I'm going to exalt my throne. Is that what he says? Look, I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. So I'm going up to heaven, and I'm going to make my throne higher than God's throne. Matter of fact, I'm going up to the very, very spot where the creator of the universe sits. And I'm taking over. Sound familiar? I know of a group of people right now who are making that same declaration right here on this planet today. And they call themselves a holy group of people. Well, let's look at what happened to the first one that decided he would do that. Jim, you don't have to turn here. I'll just tell you. All right? Jesus, in this same verse, when he refers back to it, Jesus makes this declaration. For I saw Satan cast from heaven like lightning. How quick? 186,000 miles per second. Go ahead and blink your eyes. Blink your eyes. You just didn't, you didn't even blink as fast as lightning. You didn't. You can't. As a matter of fact, did you know that when you blink, there's a motion that takes place in your eye 33 times? 33 times in your eye, there's a motion that takes place with every blink. They didn't know what to medically name it, so you know what they decided to call it? The twinkling of an eye. And what does the Bible say about rapture when it takes place? We shall be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. So bat your eye one time and multiply that by 33. And that's how fast you will be like him. But that's also how fast all those who remain on this earth in the sin and perdition that will find its way in thicker, heavier, more covering than it has ever found itself before. That's what they'll be left to contend with. And so all of these people 
who are making their claims today saying that they are the godly ones, <coughs> we'll see who God really is. Amen? Amen. One more verse, and I will hush up. Okay, fine. Two more verses because there's a question mark after the next verse. Got to move on. So, verse 5 says, Remember you not that when I was yet with you, I told you these things? Verse 6. And now you know what withholdeth, that he might be revealed in his time. Now listen to what the Greek says here. And now you know what holds down or holds back from action he who shall be revealed in his set or proper time. Who is that? Who's being revealed? The son of perdition. Who's the son of perdition? The Antichrist. Antichrist. Who is the Antichrist? Who is the Antichrist? Yeah, in particular, you've got to remember, the Antichrist actually covers two factors. The Antichrist is a person, but the Antichrist is also a movement. And the movement of Antichrist has been taking place since the beginning of the, of the church. In chapter 2 of Acts. On the same day that the upper room was filled with the flames of fire above their heads and they began to you know, speak in tongues and whatever and blah, blah, this and blah, blah, that, all that stuff. All that wonderful, fantastic, mysterious, really cool stuff that they try to make great movies over and they still can't figure it out quite yet. You know what I'm saying? All that wonderful stuff, that same day, Spirit of Antichrist flat out said, time to go to work. And has been busy ever since. But this particular faction here is one person, one being, who, by the way, will not even be able to be revealed and or named. You know, they tried to call Kissinger Antichrist at one point. Did y'all know that? You know why? Because they took the name Kissinger, they put it uh, on its side, you know, K down to his last letter, sideways, and they did a uh, mathematical figure out of the alphabets, and those alphabets in their mathematic range, came to the number 666. And so they declared that day that Henry Kissinger was beyond all shadow of doubt the Antichrist. And, nope. There's been plenty of folks been declared as the Antichrist. Do you know who the Antichrist is? I don't either. <laughs> and we won't. When we see who the Antichrist is, you know what we're going to care? Not a lick. Because you know where we'll be? In God's presence. And no sooner than we got there, it'll seem like it was time to come right back. Because in God's presence, there is no time. Now, remember what I told you. I told you that if we're going to get into this stuff, I'm not going to leave you with doom and gloom. Amen? Amen. You need to understand that, yes, there are end times. Yes, there are problems. Yes, there are bad things still yet to come. But you need to understand more importantly that there is a God who loves you. There is a Jesus Christ who died for your sins and rose from the dead and said to us, to our face within this Bible, he said, Behold, all power in heaven and earth is given to me. I give you power over all the power of the enemy. Period. That's why the Antichrist cannot be revealed until we're gone. I'd be happy to walk up to the Antichrist right now, looking right in his eyeballs, okay? I haven't used it forever today. Stand up. <laughs> today, you are the Antichrist. Don's the Antichrist for just the next 10 seconds, all right? <clears throat> I'm going to show you what I'd do if that was the Antichrist and I was allowed to do it. Because you know what? According to Jesus' words, we would be able to do this. We would walk up to the Antichrist. We would look him right in the eyes and we would say, Get thee behind me, Satan. Thou art not of God Almighty. Be gone in the name of Jesus. And you know what God would do? <laughs> Thank you. You're no longer the Antichrist. <laughs> Do you understand that? Because last time I checked, I give you power over all the power of the enemy means all the power of the enemy. And the Antichrist is a playing card. It's not the devil himself. It's a human being that the devil uses. won't be revealed until we're gone. Now, give you an idea, kind of a highlight here of what we're going to get into next week. Pastor Brian, come on up. 
We'll start off there in verse 7 of 2 Thessalonians 2. By the time we get through 2 Thessalonians 2, we're going to see where Jesus answers in concern of the end. He begins to address a deeper thing. And from that point, we're going to find ourselves in the book of Daniel for a very short period of time to help you understand where all this stuff begins to come to a head. Because quite frankly, I've seen this taught so many different ways, so many different directions over the years. Again, my goal, my goal with these teachings is to help you understand, yes, here's the truth, these things are going to take place, but here's also the truth. Those of you who trust and obey and serve God and love Him and do as He tells you to do, you have nothing to be concerned about. Amen. Nothing. Period. God's not going to let you. Uh, he said, well, the truth is they're talking about big, gigantic, mountain-sized meteors now flying around in the universe that's going to crash into the earth to destroy it. You know what? Listen. Again, you know what the Bible says? The Bible says that even after the seven-year tribulation period, two-thirds of the earth, two-thirds, literally two-thirds of the earth is going to have been destroyed. But it's still going to be inhabitable, apparently. Because the same earth that has two-thirds of it destroyed is going to be the same globe that we dwell on for a thousand years during the millennial reign. So guess what? At best, at best. Now, if you're listening, say amen. I'm trying to help you with something here. So I'm trying to get you off that thought of, oh God, it's the end, it's the end. We're going to get slammed by an asteroid, that's it, we're done. All these earthquakes, all that stuff going on in the Middle East, we're dead, we're gone. <laughs> at best, at best, if the rapture took place this afternoon, this planet would still be here for another 1,007 years. And a planet that gets hit by a mountain-sized asteroid and obliterated can't exist for a thousand and seven years. So quit worrying about the asteroids. Quit worrying about the comets. Quit worrying about when the Perseoids meteor, or however that's pronounced, Perseus, Percy, Perseus, whatever, anyhow, all them different meteors. I love watching those things, do you? You're about to see but I'll tell you what even people did with that. They get into the meteor storm. They say, oh my Lord, have mercy. The stars are falling from heaven. It's the end. That's what they used to say when they first started seeing meteor storms. Education, my friend. Education about the Word of God. Not just fluff messages that help you scratch your back and clean your ears. Hello? But the truth of God's future. For you. Amen? Amen. The last time I checked, one more word, I'm done. Better stand up now. That's my side. I'm quitting. You stand up, I'll start quitting. All right. <laughs> I know the plans that I have for you, saith the Lord. Right? Is that what he says? Amen. And what does he say at the end of that verse? <laughs> to give you an expected end. And if you look at that in the Hebrew, that expected end is defined as to give you a glorious eternity with my sin. That's what awaits us. Amen? Amen. Part three.